So today is the second of our uh, uh, LF Edge projects. Um, if you're not familiar with LF Edge, LF Edge is part of the Linux Foundation, and uh, it's a, a umbrella organization um, to essentially uh, bring together the uh, Edge related projects. And I'll let Aaron describe that um, a little bit more. Um, and so I want to introduce Aaron. Uh, if you were here last week, you would have seen Aaron on the Project Eve uh, meetup as well. Um, and uh, um, he is helping me put together the other events. Um, I will have uh, Home Edge, um, I think Open Horizon, uh, State of the Edge. There's another project called Fledge. Um, so you'll see those uh, coming up over the next few weeks. If you are interested in any one particular uh, LF Edge project, please reach out to me or Aaron and let me know. Um, we're trying to figure out which ones to bring um, across. They're all in different stages of maturity. So uh, um, with that, I guess, uh, Aaron, if you want to um, introduce yourself and uh, maybe a, just a high level of uh, what LF Edge is and, you know, uh, maybe get to Jim and then get to Jim. Sure, sounds good. Um, if you let me share my screen real quick, um, I have like three slides that so at least people can see the names of them. Um, so, let's see, application window. And hopefully I'm sharing the right thing now. All right. So uh, as Hans said, my name is Aaron Williams. I'm the dev advocate or community manager, uh, kind of do both roles uh, within LF Edge. Um, LF Edge is part of the Linux Foundation. That's the LF part. Obviously, the Edge is kind of what we are. Um, you know, we're all the projects that work down well, on the Edge. So these are kind of the sub projects um, or the kind of the umbrella organizations that are all under LF, um, obviously, as it says, we're much more than Linux. We're down here and next to Octo and Zephyr. So um, real quick, I, I'm just going to kind of go through this super fast. I want to give the time back to Jim and the exciting part. So this is kind of how uh, LF Edge works within things. Um, uh, so here, you know, we have you know, Zephyr as the OS type thing and an Acorn down here for hypervisors. Um, Eve, which we had last week, um, is kind of an OS type thing where, you know, it's a virtualization for, for um, uh, uh, you know, hardware and whatnot as, and, you know, as we go down, our Crano is a little bit more different. These are very telco specific, although they're starting to get more and more um, kind of software um, specific, but what they do is they produce uh, blueprints that allow you to uh, kind of just download the stuff, um, you know, from the blueprints, follow the blueprints, and um, you know, be able to create your solution, uh, whether it be kind of a, a set of hardware or you know, pieces of software for it. Um, Edge X is right here. It is you know the interoperability. Uh, between the IoT devices and applications. Um, now, Edge X is uh, one of our uh, highest groups. It's actually probably the largest uh, project we have and the most mature of them all. Um, so that's a great thing. So they are a stage one, um, which is what we call an impact um, project, which means it's ready to go. Um, you know, uh, it's it's already in production, everything like that. Eve, if you saw uh, from last week, is what we call in a growth stage. So it's um, you know just early on in its life cycle. Where something um, uh, like a Betel here, which is um, has uh, options for communicating uh, northbound to clouds and public clouds, uh, done by Baidu, it is a stage one. So it's just really getting started in the world. So we're, like I said, uh, the exact opposite is IHX, where it is absolutely ready to go. Um, this is kind of the same information, just kind of different on, on kind of what we're calling how we define as LF Edge, how we define the edge and where these things are. So when you end up here, where we start going into the edge, this would be kind of a regional uh, data center 
Um, so this is kind of, to me, where the edge really starts. Uh, to the telcos, they really think about the base stations as being their edge, uh, where um, you know I come from this world, uh, which is much uh, you know, farther out to down to the actual devices that uh, contain it. Once again, that's where Eve lives in this thing, where EdgeX Foundry kind of passes, you know, kind of does this whole uh, thing up to this, um, you know, the base station. So what we call the telco edge, or um, this is the absolute last part, the user edge down here. Uh, these are just kind of to give you the kind of very super quick overview of what our umbrella projects, uh, you know, what projects are in this um, edge projects things. So Arcrano is the other one that is at that impact stage. But as I said, that it's an open source stack um, that really applies for uh, blueprints to allow you to kind of get going with it. And these are all done in alphabetical order. Um, Fledge um, is another one of our uh, uh, projects Home Edge is probably the easiest one to understand. It has the best name. It is it focuses on the home, and then Open Horizon uh, kind of manages uh, service software life cycle life cycle for containerized workloads. And then State of the Edge is a little unique. That one is um, as it says here, it's open source research and publishing project. What it tries to do is kind of set the terms. Um, it has a dictionary as part of it, and then a landscape where, you know, shows you kind of where the companies are in this. It's also the one that highlighted our, or really pushed out our a white paper on kind of defining what these terms are and kind of to give the industry common things. So that way, if you um, work on the edge, you know, usually the first thing you have to do is define where you are on the edge, which edge are you? And so with with this and our white paper from that, we really uh, tried to define uh, those type of states so that way we would all have the same type of terminology. And so I'm going to stop my screen and introduce Jim White. Um, Jim is the TSC for our TSC chair, which is the technical uh, steering committee of um, EdgeX. Um, he is actually one of the co-founders from it. He comes, uh, he basically was one of the main people who built it uh, way back when it was part of uh, Dell and then Dell uh, you know, donated it as open source. He has since, uh, Jim has since moved on to another company called IoTech Systems where he's currently the CTO. And Jim, why don't you take it away and you can fill in your CV just a little bit and then show us, you know, I'm excited to see this again. It's a great presentation. Hey, appreciate it, Darren. And thanks, uh, thanks for the intro. Um, Hans, thank you as well for giving us the time and this great space. Um, it's really great to be with all of you. I'd love to be in Seattle and, and be with you, but uh, second best is to be with you um, here in this virtual meetup. I found it interesting, Hans, that you referred to you know, a, a Zoom table. It seems like Zoom has come into our lexicon almost like, you know, we talk about Googling things now. Now we have Zoom as a as a verb that we use to describe things like this. So that's great. Um, let me just do a real quick check. Can everybody see my screen? Are you seeing the slide that says EdgeX Foundry Introduction? Yep. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, so uh, real quickly, I think the introductions uh, that Aaron provided have been fantastic. So I won't speak uh, much more about myself other than to say that, yep, as Aaron indicated, I am the chairman of our EdgeX Foundry uh, Technical Steering Committee. And um, while I was the, the founder of the project under um, Dell, you'll be all happy to know that um, now I am its voice and, and no longer its chief coder, <laughs> as I like to tell everybody. Apologies in advance for any old code you see. All the good stuff you see out of EdgeX Foundry is done by people brighter, sharper, and, and much faster than I am. So uh, we've got some great engineers and would love to talk to any of you about joining up this project if um, if you have an interest. Um, I come from a company, as uh, Aaron indicated, called IOTech Systems. Um, I'll just provide one slide on what IOTech is about. We are a, uh, a global software company. We're headquartered out of the United Kingdom, uh, but we have development centers and folks all across the world. Uh, we build software, so we're not a system integrator. We'll be, we're building software products for the edge. Um, 
In particular, uh, one of the products we have is called Edge Expert. Uh, you see the icon there on the screen. Edge Expert is the commercial implementation of EdgeX Foundry. And so that which I show you today is actually also part of um, one of our products called Edge Expert. We have um, partners throughout the world as well, and that's really how we go to market. So Intel, Dell, um, groups like Accenture, who are RSIs, those are the groups that we um, go to market with. We, we provide the software that goes into their uh, Edge solutions. So my agenda here today, pretty straightforward and simple. I'd like to introduce you to our um, open source effort called EdgeX Foundry, show you what it does, how it works, and if the demo gods be with us, actually give you a, a small little demonstration of its capabilities, um, and then tell you a little bit about our platform and our community, um, and hope that you will actually uh, give it a try or point people to it, to adopt it as part of maybe your uh, Edge or IoT solutions. And for those who are even more hardcore, uh, try to entice you to join our community as a developer of our product. Um, open source lives on the commodity of uh, donations of engineers that are on this kind of call. Uh, and we are constantly seeking uh, that kind of help. And either joining formally by becoming mentors uh, through um, LF Edge or informally. You, you, do not, you do not have to be somebody who is signed up to, to LF Edge to be a contributor, to be uh, somebody who joins our community and helps out. So what is um, EdgeX Foundry? We're an open source platform, obviously coming from the Linux Foundation. We are vendor neutral. We are um, platform neutral. We are agnostic with regard to, to hardware. We run on Intel, we run on ARM. Uh, we're agnostic with regard to OS. Linux, Unix, uh, Windows, Mac OS, uh, we even run in some cases on uh, real-time operating systems. Um, we're an Apache 2 project. For those of you who might not be aware what that means. It means that from an open source perspective, when you pull down EdgeX Foundry, you can do anything you want with the code. You can build commercial products out of it. You can change it any way you'd like. And none of that has to come back into the organization, meaning you don't have to tell us what you're doing with it. You can develop commercial products, make uh, it for sale, and never let us know about that, and obviously not share any royalties with us. We'd love it if you would, but you do not have to. There are different types of uh, open source efforts out there, some which have um, license agreements which are a little bit more uh, stringent or a little bit more, let's call them business unfriendly. And Apache 2 license is very, very friendly. And that's obviously on purpose as we're trying to build solutions that help organizations achieve uh, IoT and edge success. Project was started back in uh, April 2017. So you can see we've been at this now for almost uh, four years, and I think you'll see through the, the quality that we have and the, the demo that I give you today, we are ready for prime time. We're actually used in a lot of uh, IoT and Edge solutions today. I've got on the screen here too, uh, Edgy, our mascot. Uh, if you're in open source effort, you know the O'Reilly books, you know you gotta have a mascot and Edgy is ours. It actually comes with a story. Um, the idea behind it is that uh, an octopus actually has multiple brains, if you will. Not only does it have its brain, its head, but its tentacles, which reach out and are its sensors, actually have a, a brain as well. And that's really what EdgeX is about, is really trying to provide intelligence at the edge, as well as getting all that data up in the brain, which might be your enterprise or your cloud system. And I'll try to draw some analogies to that through our conversation here today. So with uh, that in mind, um, to give you some perspective, because I know we speak a lot, uh, Aaron did a great job of trying to talk about all the projects, but even that, it's words that can sometimes get lost in the shuffle. What I tell people is that EdgeX is middleware. It's edge middleware. What does that mean? Well, when you start to look at connecting things, when we talk about the internet of things, when you start connecting things, what you quickly start to realize is that there are all sorts of protocols out there. For those of us who are in IT enterprise worlds, you know, we're used to speaking TCP IP amongst all of our applications and our systems. The edge world doesn't speak uh, TCP IP, or at least not all of it speaks TCP IP. You've got all these protocols that are gonna be unfamiliar to you if you come from an IT world. And they run on all sorts of interesting little devices, uh, some smaller, some bigger, but primarily when you think about things, you're thinking about sensors and devices that operate in what I call hot, stinky, smelly places, places you don't wanna be as a human. And that's why we have machines there in factories, in, in, um, uh, in building automation types of environments. Our EdgeX system helps connect those things and all the protocols they speak into your IT world. 
So they provide that middleware that, that does the translation, that provides the interaction with our IT environments in both directions. We help get the data from things like your thermostats and things like your little sensors into your IT world, but also allow your IT world to communicate back down into this thing world so you can do what we call actuation, which is mean trigger some sort of action or response at the edge. So simply put, EdgeX is that thin layer of middleware to do that um, translation and the communication back and forth to things. Um, some of our goals, why do we exist? Well, we, we built uh, EdgeX Foundry to try to provide a common open platform for what we call unifying the edge. Meaning if you do go out and you try to connect all the things in the world to your IT environment, you gotta learn all sorts of protocols. You gotta try and figure out all sorts of uh, software device firmware and, and device drivers to communicate with all that stuff that's difficult. We're trying to unify that so that if you're just trying to get things connected into your IT world, here's this platform that you can use so you don't have to understand all the minutia underneath the covers. And that goes in both directions. If you're an OT guy and you speak a particular protocol, you don't necessarily want to know all about the enterprise and the cloud. So EdgeX provides that common platform that tries to unify that. It's the Rosetta Stone between our OT and our IT world. This also hopefully enables you to get to solutions much faster and get to where you can actually develop uh, edge solutions by not having to build it all yourself. You can start from a framework that gets you a big head start. And we do that in, the, in an interoperable plug and play fashion. There are gonna be elements of this world that you do in, in IoT or Edge where you have uh, either some secret sauce or pieces or parts that you need to integrate in that uh, nobody else has or nobody else is, is familiar with. We wanna provide that capability for you to do that. We're providing a base solution, but there are gonna be pieces that you need to, to um, create on your own and add your own value. And EdgeX allows for that in a very open way. So really building these systems in kind of a collaborative way, providing um, what we kind of consider a loose industry standard just by our platform to provide for that interoperability and the connectivity between IT and OT worlds. I'm, I'm careful to try and watch questions coming in as well. I know I can tend to, to ramble on. So if you do have a question, please post it in the, uh, in the question section. I'm, I'm trying to watch it as we go through here as well. Um, a brief history, and, and not that history is all that important, but we started this project when I was at Dell in 2015. Actually, Jason Shepard, who was on last week, uh, was the co-founder of the project. Um, he, he essentially uh, raised the idea in the, in the uh, client division of Dell when we were coming out with gateways and and I was the chief architect and lead engineer for putting this together. So it's been a project that even though in um, terms of open sourceness, it's been around for three plus years, it's actually existed for much longer than that because it's, you know, this, this is a takes a village type of moment where it really takes a lot of energy to build these kinds of platforms. We contributed to the Linux Foundation, as I mentioned, in 2017. We started um, with a 50 founding members uh, to get it started. Linux Foundation told us at the time that was the largest starting in terms of organizational membership project they had. And today we're up through uh, 75 members as part of LF Edge, as uh, Aaron uh, mentioned. We're now, we're now not just part of Linux Foundation, we're part of that umbrella project called LF Edge. We release twice a year and we release our software under a, uh, a code name, if you will, that's uh, alphabetized like you'd see with, uh, with uh, Android. We just released the Hanoi release in November and we're getting ready for a big release in the springtime of 2021 that we're calling Ireland that is likely to be EdgeX 2.0. Uh, so kind of our second big and major release coming out here this spring. Um, how does it work? Now, there are a lot of words on this page, and I, like most of us probably in this industry, can try and kill you with slideware. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna try and show you a couple of pictures and cover some of these words here quickly, and then we're gonna go to a demo. So hopefully by the time we get done here, you get a general sense of how it works, but let me just cover a couple of highlights here. It is an application, EdgeX is an application, again, that is that middleware, and it is an application comprised of many microservices. If you will, if you're not familiar with that term, think lots of mini, um, uh, many applications or many components that work together to deliver the application. We write those in multiple languages. We are what we call polyglot believers. Use the right technology, the right programming language to meet the need for any specific part. In edge worlds, we find that to be very, very beneficial because it's really a heterogeneous environment. 
all these pieces and parts are segmented into what I'll call layers uh, that support the data flow um, from the things up to the enterprise and back down. Uh, sensor data is collected by a type of uh, microservice we call a device service. As the name implies, it talks to devices, it talks to things. That device service passes data into our core services where the data can be persisted at the edge. And we'll talk about why here in just a bit. And from our core services, it then passes the data on to application services. Application services do uh, get the data uh, to your enterprise, to your cloud in whatever shape or form you need. It does transfer transformations, formatting, filtering. It gets the data where it needs to be, how it needs to be, when it needs to be. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, kind of the idea of enterprise application integration, that's really what the application services do. They prepare the data for the enterprise. Application services also prepare the data so that it can be used locally at the edge uh, to trigger actuation, to trigger things to do something. Think about uh, you know uh, receiving lots of data and uh, in your car. What determines that the airbag needs a fire? Some sort of you know sensor that senses a collision, and now it has to send that airbag into action. Application services prepare the data so that the analytics at the edge can do those kinds of things. Um, and then we also provide the uh, capability to um, trigger actuation through what we call command services, and I'll speak more of that here in a bit. Each of our microservices as part of EdgeX uh, has a REST API around it, so you can communicate with it and uh, take action with it, maybe get its status. And in some places, we also provide a message bus to uh, provide for kind of a, a better data flow and uh, a preservation of uh, data uh, through certain parts of our system. And I'll, I'll address that in the diagram here coming up in just a bit. Our, our services, these microservices that make up the application, uh, you can deploy them as is on what we call bare metal, but we also provide uh, deployment capability through things like Docker containers, through Ubuntu snaps. We're agnostic as much to hardware platforms as we are to how you orchestrate and deploy EdgeX and all of its services. So we provide these out of convenience. You don't have to use them, but when you're trying to deploy an application like EdgeX to some sort of node, it's often helpful to have that kind of capability. So here's a diagram of the EdgeX uh, application architecture. Each one of the little boxes you see here on the screen represents one of our microservices. And as I mentioned, we've got these layers. We've got the device services, which are at the, the bottom of the screen, or what we call the south side representation of, a, of an edge environment. Core services in between in the deep purple, supporting services and, and uh, application services on top of that. So how does uh, EdgeX work? Well, let's say you've got some sort of thermostat out there and it's reporting temperatures. EdgeX would have a device service that would communicate with that sensor in its protocol of choice. A lot of uh, thermostats, a lot of uh, uh, HVAC systems speak a protocol called BACnet. So through BACnet and a BACnet device service, we'd be collecting that sensor data off of that thermostat, in this case, temperature readings, like it's 102 degrees in here. That data is then sent via EdgeX to a service we call Core Data. Core data persists that data wherever EdgeX is running, what we call locally at the edge, and it does so for two reasons. You need the data stored locally if you need to take a backward look at the data to determine if things are changing. You know, if it's 102 right now, what was it 10 minutes ago? Because maybe the change in temperature is what's gonna trigger me to take some sort of action. You also need to store the data locally because edge systems are typically involved in what we call intermittent connectivity uh, communications with our enterprise and our cloud. Think of a, of a system like EdgeX running on a boxcar or running out on a shipping container out in, in an ocean vessel. You don't have constant connectivity there. You have to store the data locally for a period of time and then when reconnected, you forward that data on to your enterprise or cloud. So we need that persistence for those reasons, and that's what core data does. Core data then also sends the data up to our application services, as I mentioned, and it's the application services that prepare the data from the edge to be used by the what we call northbound uh, needs, which be cloud system, say Google or Amazon or Azure, uh, could be your enterprise application. It could be some sort of on-prem application if we were in some sort of factory, for example, or a, an on-premise database. Whatever your enterprise, whatever the need for your thing data is, this is what the application services do. They prepare that data and push it up to those northbound systems. 
Application services also prepare the data though for use by what we call the local analytics at the edge. Now in EdgeX, we provide a reference implementation rules engine. Think about it as an if then conditional, right? If the temperature is too hot, then what should I do? Um, but this is really a place where you can provide any kind of analytics you like. In fact, a lot of organizations, including mine, uh, use things like um, uh, machine learning agents at the edge to trigger uh, more advanced analytics and trigger more advanced type of operations. So the application services get the data ready for these analytics or local analytics packages to include rules engine. They look at the data at the edge. So we're not up in the cloud here. We're now down at the edge. We're right next to the sensors or we're right in your car and we're looking at the data. And with that data, we make decisions about what needs to be done through our command service. We communicate back down to the device service layer where we can then command devices to do something, to actuate. In this case, maybe stop some sort of machine because it's too hot and we don't want to damage that machine. So this is the workflow that is EdgeX. It's all about collection of data, making it available to our enterprise, at the same time using the data locally to command at the edge what must happen so you have low latency types of needs. Uh, you, you want to obviously use the data at the edge and trigger things quickly. You don't always want to make a decision up in the cloud. Uh, the common example I, I make, and I'm not saying that EdgeX is used to, to drive this kind of use case, we don't, but similar types of use cases is in your car you have an airbag. You would not want the car to have to call the cloud to make a decision to fire your airbag. Some decisions have to occur at the edge for safety or for um, monetary reasons, and that's the kind of thing that EdgeX does well. Lots of other boxes you see on the screen, supporting services that you'd need in almost any kind of application like alerts and notification and scheduling, all helping to support this basic data flow and the actuation at the edge. So boiling it down, the layers, all these services, what is it all about again? We're edge middleware and essentially we provide dual transformation from things and the way things communicate up to our uh, application environments through our application services. So we translate thing and thing protocol information into um, IT, typically TCP IP based protocols um, so that that can be used in our enterprise or at least used to start to think about um, how to communicate and how to effectively use the data we collect at the edge. That's really what EdgeX is all about, edge middleware. Uh, there are a number of tenets we use to guide the development of our architecture. Uh, I'm gonna kind of let you read through that, but you can see, again, we are platform agnostic because at the edge, you're gonna find all sorts of different devices you have to run on, all sorts of different operating systems. So we have to have that as a major tenant. We have to be very flexible because all those little boxes that I showed on the screen, we know that you have, in some cases in your environment, replacements for that. You might have a better rules engine. You might have a better uh, notification service, or you might have to customize one to deal with certain security vulnerabilities in your environment. Our architecture is flexible and microservice based so that you can do that. Again, we believe in store and forward. We believe in um, operating with intelligence at the edge so you can make those decisions quickly. And we have to operate in environments where you have both new things, what we call green field environments, but also old things. In the OT world, seven years, is the cycle from which things get refreshed. If we think about our laptops or our cell phones, we're replacing them, what, maybe every two years, or maybe in my wife's case, about every seven months. Uh, in the OT world out there in the field, things don't change that quickly. So we have to operate in an environment where steadiness and long terms of support are things we have to address. EdgeX is also built to be distributed. As I showed you that box with all of our services and I talk about it running at the edge, we often think about it running as kind of one cohesive set of services running on a box. But in actuality, what we find is EdgeX is usually distributed over whatever compute you have available at the edge. You might have a device service running on a thing and then you have the rest of EdgeX running on something like an IoT gateway or maybe even parts of it running in the cloud. EdgeX operates fine in that fashion because it is microserviced and it can be broken across all these boundaries. It runs wherever you see fit. We tend to push as much as possible closer to the edge to reduce latency, but there are pieces you can run on higher end machines where you need that compute power. 
We use lots of different technology in EdgeX. As I mentioned, we're, we're polyglot believers, so our programming language uh, is varied, but a lot of the application is written in Golang. It provides a very ni nice, tight application executable um, and is uh, able to be used across many different environments. Uh, we do use some C for those things in particular where you're communicating with devices that are more legacy-based and only speak C. We use things like JavaScript for our UI. Uh, REST communication is out there. We use databases like Redis and Mongo. Uh, we do have some messaging technology uh, underneath the covers so that where you need uh, to have a broker that, that has um, the ability to store messages and, and translate them in an asynchronous fashion, uh, some of that's built in underneath the covers. And of course, as an open source project, we also use a lot of open source technology. So we use uh, projects like Console and Kong and Kuiper to do various pieces of what we need done at the edge. As I mentioned, we release twice a year. We've got a really steady um, and, and long history from an open source perspective of project releases. This is one thing I'm very, very proud of. We release steadily every six months. Uh, we've released steadily for the last three and a half years of existence. And we've got a roadmap that carries us well into uh, 2022 and, and beyond in terms of features we know we need to build, as well as kind of a, a how we're going to get there through a, a step uh, mechanism. Uh, as uh, Aaron mentioned, when you look at open source projects, you'll see some of them out there are just getting started. Uh, in some cases, you'll find not Linux Foundation projects, but if you look outside of Linux Foundation, you'll see open source projects are kind of fit and starts in terms of getting going and producing something that people can actually use. EdgeX is a industrial strength platform that's being used today in a multitude of applications with a steady progression going forward. And we would love to have people join us and, and keep that effort going. You might ask, well, how big is EdgeX? You know, what, what kind of platform can I run EdgeX on? How, how big or how small is it? We designed it from the get-go to be able to run on something like a Raspberry Pi. And indeed, when you think about IoT and Edge worlds, if you read a lot of blog posts and things out there, that's kind of the reference point people make when they think about you know, how, how big platforms are and how cheap platforms might need to be to run at the edge. So yes, we can definitely run on a Raspberry Pi, but we've gone way beyond that today. Um, if you look at our Hanoi release that just came out in November, uh, it takes about 168 uh, megabytes of memory. A minimal platform can even go in smaller spaces than that. We'll, we'll usually consume about 9% of uh, a RAM on, on something like an uh, HP MP9. Um, and our container size, if you, if you look at all the Docker containers, we're about 335 meg, although typically you're not gonna use all the containers. Your use case may, may allow you to drop down and, and have a minimum deployment that's around 125 megabyte um, for its needs. So you can see we're a pretty small platform, yet very powerful and very, very flexible. From a project standpoint, want to come join our community? We'd love to have you. You're going to join a community of about 180 contributors. Uh, we have a lot more people that also include things like the Linux Foundation staff, like Aaron and others who contribute to our marketing efforts, uh, legal experts. Um, so 180 is the, the contributors, the guys who are coding, guys and gals who are coding. Beyond that, we've got a very big ecosystem that includes 75 companies, uh, LF, and all the support that they bring with us. It's a very large community. Um, to date, we've had 7.4 million container downloads. That sounds impressive, and it is, but don't think that EdgeX is one container. EdgeX is usually about a dozen containers per each deployment. So we estimate we have about a half a million deployments worldwide today. We have lots of visitors to our website. We've got about 30 contributors putting code into the new uh, release each month, and we usually have on the average of about 150 commits per month towards each uh, six month release. So a really active community, great group of people, and, and we'd love to have you either adopt EdgeX, come join us in our efforts to uh, make it work and, and be used in solutions, or again, if you're a hardcore, we'd love to see you be a contributor in any shape or form. Contributors, by the way, don't always have to be guys who are coding. We've got documentation and marketing and all sorts of efforts that um, regularly need contributors in any way, shape, or form you can provide it. Lots of adopters out there. Uh, some adopters, as you can imagine, I can't talk about because they, they remain um, private in their use of EdgeX. But here are some that I can talk about. Accenture, a big um, system integrator, is using um, EdgeX as part of their AIP uh, program. Thundersoft is a big, huge SI in China. Uh, Zhangjing Intelligence, 
has got an amazing number of clients. They've got about a thousand deployments in in China, doing all sorts of things from monitoring um, uh, uh, power fields. In fact, they they showed me live one night some places in China, which I'm probably sure I wasn't supposed to see. But they're using it to monitor and manage all sorts of environments out there, especially in the energy sector. Uh, HP uh, is using it in their retail platforms. Tipco is using it in a project they call Product Air or Project Air, which is a kind of a horizontal um, solution that they embed with a lot of their capabilities. And we even have other open source efforts using us. Uh, Aaron mentioned this project called Home Edge, which is based on trying to bring edge computing to the home. They're using EdgeX and piece of EdgeX inside of their efforts. So uh, a multitude of uses and a multitude of use cases out there. Who's behind it? Here's some of the companies I mentioned. We've got uh, over 75 companies today as part of LF Edge, and a number of these companies are big, huge contributors into our effort. Again, we started with 50. We've already grown to 75. Uh, a number of names out there that you hopefully recognize. Some of them uh, might be names that you're actually part of. Some people also ask us, why the X? Why did you call it Edge X? Um, if you go into legal needs, you find out that when you want to try to trademark something in the software world, you can't just call something Edge. You can't just call something Foundry. You got to have some way of, of making it trademarkable. And we wanted that because there are pieces of what we do that we do set up things like certification and training programs. So the X is really out there to help us um, from a legal standpoint, uh, uh, allow us to trademark and certify things. Uh, but it's also out there really to kind of to, to let us know this is a, this is a, a cross platform. It's cross purposeful. It brings uh, edge uh, computing the operational technology world and the IT world together. So we're at that crossed uh, junction of different types of worlds out there. Organizationally, we're set up with lots of committees and lots of uh, working groups. We'd love to have you join any, but uh, again, you can see that we are really relatively structured, just like you would find in any kind of company about how we manufacture our software and how we put it together. So if you have a need, if you have a desire, if you have uh, an interest, let me know. There is a home for you somewhere out there in our organization to help with, if not coding, things like testing, things like uh, outreach, things like marketing. So lots of places to use all sorts of people. With that, let me hopefully uh, show you a quick demo here of EdgeX. Um, let me go to one slide here. So this is my little demo that I'm going to show you. So let me just give you an architectural diagram of it so you can kind of appreciate what's going on. So we talk about EdgeX and it connects things to our IT worlds. In this case, I'm going to show you um, three devices or sensors. I've got a moisture sensor. It costs all about 15 cents out there. It detects uh, water or moisture, as the name would apply. I've got that hooked up to a Raspberry Pi running a device service from EdgeX. I've got a Dell Wise Thin Gateway, uh, which is connected up to a, uh, a Comet uh, temperature probe and also a, a, a pat light, a signal pat light. So a couple of other devices there. Uh, the temperature probe speaks a, a protocol called Modbus, widely used in industrial settings. The pat light speaks SNMP. And if you're familiar with things like networks, a lot of networking things speak SNMP. So we've got three different types of sensors speaking three different types of uh, protocols. One sensor is connected to uh, a Raspberry Pi. Um, the other sensors are connected into this main gateway. And I've got EdgeX running on that main gateway. Picture here, it's called Rizzo. So these sensors are all bringing data into EdgeX running on Rizzo, where it's going to make decisions. When it detects moisture, it's going to light up our signal tower. When it detects a temperature too hot, it's also going to light up a different band on our signal tower to show you how EdgeX can use data to trigger things locally right there on the spot. At the same time it's doing that, EdgeX is going to be shipping data off to another box I've got, another gateway, and that gateway is going to pretend to be or serve as kind of my enterprise. In particular, I've got um, Influx database running on it. I've got Telegraph and Grafana on running on it. So you can see the kinds of enterprise applications that might use this edge data. And in this case, I'll show you a nifty little graph that uh, is produced out of the data coming in from EdgeX, say coming in from the systems in the field. So that's my um, high level picture of the demo. Let me now switch over here. So here's my, my little home setup for my little project. And to, to show you it's real, it's live, there are my fingers. Um, I've got my um, Raspberry Pi here that, again, is running that device service that connects to this little uh, moisture sensor, a uh, little, little cheap moisture sensor that when the two probes connect, um, obviously, it will detect uh, water present. That's sending data in 
to um, my uh, EdgeX instance running on my little Dell gateway. That uh, Dell gateway is also connected to a Comet uh, temperature probe. And again, my uh, SNMP pat light. And it's a big, tall pat light, so I'll have to change the focus of the camera when we need to show you the lights. So as I'm monitoring from an EdgeX perspective, as I'm monitoring things here, I'll stick the um, I'll stick the temp uh, the uh, uh, water probe, the moisture probe, into a glass of water here. And you may not have seen it because of the the camera angle here, but immediately what it did is it lit up this uh, yellow band on my pat light. So that's data being collected by the temperature probe, being sent into EdgeX running on the Raspberry Pi that then forwards it on to the main EdgeX uh, instance and all the microservices that sees that data, uses its rules engine to say, hey, wait a minute, we got moisture out there, and then sends another signal down to another device, in this case over SNMP, to my pat light. So that's one kind of example of how EdgeX is used to read data from devices and then trigger something on some other device at the edge. Likewise, um, I'm going to show you my temperature pros here. It says it's what now 75 degrees in here right now, a little warm in Arizona. I'm going to put my hand around the temperature probe and slowly raise the temperature of that probe. And as it's doing that, I've got it programmed so that EdgeX is actually looking for the temperature to rise above uh, 76 degrees. And so right now it's slowly rising and there you see the red pat light signal come on. So another example of reading another device, in this case a protocol called Modbus, sending that data in, measuring that data and using that data to actuate things at the edge. So this could all be running, as you can see, in a pretty tight little sphere. You could even run it on a single box and have all these pieces and parts working in a pretty tight environment out there in the field. But from an enterprise perspective, we want that data to be shipped home so we can further study it, uh, determine other ways we can use that kind of information. So that's where at the same time it's doing all that work, EdgeX can be shipping this data off to an enterprise. And in particular, let me bring up another screen here real quickly. So I've got uh, all that data is being now brought into um, an Influx database. So you can see here a couple of graphs. Uh, it's bringing in all the temperature data. I just rose the temperature up uh, on my probe. And so it increased that, uh, that graph. Uh, this little um, electrical looking signal here is really the, the measurement of moisture detection on that moisture probe. So all the data is now being sent from EdgeX out in the field, so to speak, on that gateway being sent in to my enterprise, in this case, an influx database. And then obviously I can start to use that to formulate um, new ideas about what might be happening out there in the world, or in this simple example, at least giving you a nice visual uh, graph of, in this case, the temperature that's being seen in this room. You can obviously easily imagine putting um, ML on top of the, the, the data that's coming in and starting to theorize all sorts of interesting things about you know, why are we seeing moisture detected or why are the temperatures rising and how can we prevent some sort of damage to equipment or something out there with these kinds of sensors uh, deployed in the field. And of course, we're only looking at one instance. You typically want to do that across a multiple multitude of uh, edge instances and devices out there all being brought in and studied at the enterprise. We uh, we have EdgeX again deployed in um, Docker containers. So we run things like Pertainer to actually monitor and see all my containers out there running. And I can get, go into any one of the containers and pull up the log. So it's built into what I would call or classify as standard traditional um, software engineering principles with all the various tools and things you can use to help monitor and understand what's going on at the edge with your software as well as that data flow coming in. Okay, with that, let me see. I think let me pop back real quickly here to my presentation. So how do you get started if you're interested in, with uh, EdgeX? Our documentation is out there at docs.edgexfoundry.org. Uh, by the way, we also have a website called www.edgexfoundry.org. So we keep things pretty simple for you. There's good quick start guides out there in our documentation and our website as well. And we have a Slack channel. So if you start to want to get into EdgeX and you want to learn a little bit more, but you've got questions or you're having issues, we've got a great community that stands by on the Slack channel to help you out. Lots of other project links here. Um, so there is our GitHub uh, site where all of our code is. Uh, again, uh, documentation, blogs, uh, email distribution lists, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and all the social media uh, places where you go to learn more. Um, do a Google search of EdgeX Foundry, all one word, and it'll take you to these places and more. In fact, um, 
it's it's a pretty popular search out there right now on the IoT and edge spaces. Lastly, I'm going to make a shameless plug for my company. As I mentioned, we provide a product called Edge Expert, which is a commercial implementation of EdgeX Foundry. And you can see here by the graph on the um, right-hand side, we take EdgeX and we add to it. We add additional connectors. We add additional decision-making capability. We add uh, ease of use and user interface capability. And we provide deployment expertise. Uh, how you get EdgeX deployed out to environments is part of what we do as well. So if you're into EdgeX and or you're looking to try to use EdgeX in actual commercial settings, um, IOTech is a channel where you can uh, leverage to help you get that done. How are we doing on time? Five minutes after six. So with that, Hey, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Take any questions people have. All right. Uh, Carl had a few questions. Uh, so I'm going to bring him onto stage first. That was awesome. That's a yeah. pretty mature product. That was uh, very awesome. And um, I, I'm, I'm just inquiring um, who uses or who acquires and uses your your products more? Is it a data broker or is it an IoT module vendor? Ah, great question, Carl. And the answer is uh, all the above. Um, we uh, you know give you give you some examples. We work with a um, a major uh, uh, power distributor out of Italy. Uh, they're using EdgeX and their solutions to manage and monitor um, all the the devices associated with a, a power grid and power systems uh, oh, throughout so, Italy. Oh, so that they're um, probably they're probably using a gateway for the collection of the sensor data, right? You got it. You got it. Yeah. Um, at the same time, you know, we're working with um, here in the U.S. Uh, we're working with a, a major uh, provider of HVAC systems, um, and they offer EdgeX as an option to people to you know help bring that HVAC systems into a central location, right? So that's kind of more of a an OEM or vendor of uh, mm -hmm. HVAC solutions, yeah. not necessarily using EdgeX on their own, but selling it as kind of an add-on to their capability. So. Absolutely. I'd call it a, an IoT device vendor. But I wanted to drill down um, because of the nature of what my company is doing and what we're doing. Um, we see the gateway vendors and the IoT device vendors uh, on these robots, machines, even connected cars. But we're working with the cellular IoT module manufacturers as well. And they want to do more at the edge with the data before, because it's expensive to get to the cloud. So they want to do things before you reach the cloud using AI, machine learning, uh, and, and data analytics uh, right at the edge. Our technology allows that. Um, but, uh, but getting back to that, I think it's fascinating because I was in this business in the 90s, uh, and I remember Modbus protocol when I was, uh, when I was in this business, analog stuff. But I, um, I think I've got another question. Um, let me let me go back and see um, the the other question that I asked. Um, yeah, so so basically, you're almost like a broker with the data because you 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 take the ingested data and then you get it. You you really you're kind of like uh, this the um you're you're kind of like taking it from one area, which is the the area where the sensor collects the data, and you bring it up uh, and prepare it. Uh, I think you're preparing it to pack, not directly to the cloud, but to get ready to be packed. I think it doesn't go directly to the cloud after you pass it off. Am I right? Uh, no, we actually can send it to the cloud as well. Typically, we're going to be running on something like a gateway then. So okay. we would talk to the sensors. The gateway yeah. where EdgeX is running yeah. has the ability, you know, we have connectors to Azure and Amazon and Google. So, uh, yeah, we can do that. We don't have to do that. Uh, you know, that's typically where those discussions happen. I love it. You know, you mentioned how, you know, it's expensive to send things to cloud. It's my favorite customer. We go out and we talk to people who have developed solutions in an edge world where they, they took a bunch of sensors and they connected them directly to the cloud. And they found out, oh, my gosh, you know, our bill now is eight times what it was before. And we yeah. said, well, we have a solution to that, right? We can we can put a gateway there. We can let the sensors talk to that gateway where EdgeX is running. We can filter the data. We can use the data locally where you do have to do some decision making, but then we can filter 
filter it and get you just the pieces you need to the cloud where you can make maybe further intelligence or analytics or, or like you said, use some of your products to really well, you know well, call through the data. Well, Thundersoft is using our technology already right now. Um, Thundersoft was one of the companies I think you referenced. To, uh, yeah, I think yeah. that. That's very cool because yeah. they, have, they have a gateway, uh, more industrial and uh, nuclear power plant stuff, right? Um, you got it. Yep. So it is very, very interesting. But I think it comes back, to, I think everything comes back down to cost. And, and I think it comes back down to the gateway vendor would like to process more before the cloud. The cellular IoT module vendor would like to process more before the cloud. But I think, I think that I'm not sure if you're missing this key point, which is I'm not seeing how your organization monetizes the data beyond just being a, a broker. I don't see how you're monetizing. Yeah. Yeah, great, great question, Carl. And Edgex itself is not monetizing. It is a broker. It is middleware. Its intention is to get uh, to a point where you can provide solutions quicker. So if, just like you mentioned, Thundersoft, you know, they needed that broker and they're building it as part of their product. That's why it's open source. I get you it. Got it. You All got right, it. I'm going yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna to let, let other people ask questions. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Hans. All right, uh, let me see. So it looks like, uh, so Amar had a question, but it looks like he left. So I'll ask his question. Uh, all right, thanks for the overview. It was really good. How does EdgeX work with a solution which could be using AWS Greengrass or Azure IoT Edge, especially if a solution is already tied to a particular cloud platform? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so thanks for that, Amar. Sorry, he's, he's not here. Um, so EdgeX, you know, in some ways, um, EdgeX would be, I don't want to say competition, we're open source effort, those are commercial efforts. Uh, but some of those modules, like an Amazon Greengrass, is trying to do some of the same things, right? Which are connecting the thing world up, in this case, directly to uh, an Amazon product. So that's one of the first differentiations is EdgeX is open. It, it is agnostic, um, and so we connect to multiple clouds, in fact, simultaneously, if you'd like. Um, and then in terms of connectivity, that's typically where we find, in fact, we actually, through through IOTech, we actually partner with Amazon and, and are working with their, their teams, like uh, their Greengrass team. They don't always have the OT expertise and the connectivity. So even though they've got this, this Greengrass, or in Azure's case, they've got IoT Edge, as a small little component that can run at the edge, they don't have the connectivity tissue to talk to all these protocols. They're increasing those uh, by day, but but most of the time they're working with companies like ours to increase that capability through things like EdgeX. So in other words, you could have, and we have seen where EdgeX could feed a green grass that then feeds Amazon, if you'd like, to feed an edge that then feeds Azure, if you like. Don't have to do it that way. And again, there is a fair amount of overlap here, but EdgeX is trying to be that agnostic platform, multi-sensor, but multi-cloud, multi-enterprise, whereas those products are obviously built for very specific needs of a particular cloud vendor. Right. Um, okay, so uh, Eric, uh, Eric can't come to the stage, so I'll ask his question. So Jim, you said that the logic in your demo was done in EdgeX. Does EdgeX provide an environment which the logic is implemented, or was the logic implemented as a client? Yeah, so we we borrow uh, from open source capability there. So the the logic, if you will, the thing that's making the decision is a rules engine, and we use right now the reference implementation of EdgeX uses a rules engine from uh, from a. a an organization, an open source organization called EMQX, uh, Kuiper. It's a Kuiper rules engine. We've used others in the past. We used to use, uh, we were bigger when we first started, we used uh, uh, a Java platform and we had uh, Java rules engine. But it's a it's a, a place where you can really drop in whatever intelligence analytics you'd like. The, the way that EdgeX is formulated, data is sent to that capability, that logic center, wherever one you'd like to use, and then it is able to send commands into uh, the rest of EdgeX to trigger things. Um, in IOTech, for example, my company, we use uh, Node-RED, which is very easily programmed. You can use a different scripting to add your own logic or rules. All that needs to happen is the data from the sensors need to be shipped to this logic center. You provide the rules around what you want to have happen, 
and then you provide links into the commands you want to have actuated back down. So EdgeX provides that data flow. What really is at the heart of the logic could matter uh, not as far as EdgeX concerns, and it's very flexible, allows you to add your own. Cool, all right. We have a question from Milan. I'm gonna invite him onto the stage. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the benefit of a platform, right? If it doesn't support it and open yeah. source, you can add your own. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, we're 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 not making money at EdgeX. We're we're helping to have the companies who join EdgeX really make the money. Right, right, right. right. Uh, okay, it looks like Milan's having some issues. Um, okay, I'll just ask his question. I'll see if he can still come on the stage. Uh, does your company's version of EdgeX provide a commercially supported option? Not having this option can be an impediment to commercial adoption. Yeah, absolutely, Milan. We have to, right? We uh, the open source community is just that it's open source. It provides the the code and all the the capabilities uh, for free. Um, you have to build your own support around that if you're going to use the open source effort. Which which organizations do, especially if you're a software vendor like we are. That's exactly what you do. You take the open source and then you commercialize it. And as part of that commercialization, from an IoTech perspective, we provide different levels of support based on your use case. You know, do you need a 24-hour help desk? Then you know, you have one level of support, just like you would find with any any software product. Uh, so uh, we are not, by the way, the only company that's doing that. Uh, we'd like to think we're the leaders, uh, and we obviously are leaders in the EdgeX Foundry community, but we have other organizations as part of EdgeX and contributing and working on EdgeX that are doing the same thing. They commercialize EdgeX, add to it, but also provide that support. Organizations that adopt um, any kind of solution like this are typically going to want to uh, to get that support unless they themselves are an organization that's a software company that's providing that support. Cool. All right. That was the last of the official question, uh, the question of the post -ask.